no doubt had an exciting week. Exciting, of course, last weekend was a very, very exciting time for us, enjoyable time for us, for those who got to be involved. Um, as with most, th most things, I'm, when we got here, I have a timeline. You won't see it. It's for me. But on that timeline, one thing that as we develop some things, and of course it, um, adjust, depending on various activities that we're involved in, but on that timeline, one thing that I had down, a transition period, immediately following our truth form, that transition period is mainly in my mind, but it has to do with a focus. It has to do with regaining our focus. You see, sometimes when we have, whether it's a gospel meeting or some event like that, there's a great deal of excitement, a great deal of energy, a great deal of enjoyment. But then after that, over a period of maybe a week or two, we get right back into the rut that we were in before and we lose that excitement, we lose that enjoyment, we lose those things that we had for the Lord and His Word. So one thing that I had planned, one thing I have as I've outlined some things for myself, is focus. This past week, it was very important for me to look within myself and to refocus on some things. You see, as you know, we were gone for two weeks and then we came back and, and had a, oh, the wonderful event that was the truth form. The Bible teaches us that we have to examine ourselves, constantly examine ourselves. We have to make sure we're do what we're doing is right. We have to make sure we're living correctly. We have to look within ourselves to see if there are areas within ourselves that we need to correct, need to change. And the truth of the matter is, as we look at those areas, all of us have them. They're just in different spots and different places. So as we begin this week, we're going to begin a, a series of sermons on the idea of focus. You say, well, how in the world can you stretch out this idea of focus over several weeks. Well, you'll see. But we're going to focus. We're going to get back to some things that we have to, to really key in on and, and put our eyes upon and set our minds upon. And as we do those things, we can bring ourselves back to where we need to be to be able to move forward as Christian soldiers, as members of the body of Christ. Focus. This first week, this first lesson about focus is going to be about the idea, faith. Faith. We read in the Bible a great deal about faith. Everything that we do, everything that we are begins with faith. Did you know everybody has a faith? In other words, everybody believes something. Everybody stands for something. Even if that stand for something is to stand for nothing, that's what they stand for. That's what they are. The atheists, they stand for something. They stand for the fact that they believe there is no God. You say, well, that's not really a belief. That's an a absence of belief, isn't it? Let me ask you something. If someone has an absence of belief, would they push their absence of belief but you see, we see the atheist community pushing their belief. So it goes far beyond an absence. It, it's a belief in something. A belief that there is no God. As Christians, we have faith. That faith is built upon something, isn't it? We read in the Bible in, first, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 that the Apostle Paul wrote, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That power of God unto salvation is the gospel, which is described in some circumstances as the faith. The faith. The system of faith. And based upon the gospel, we either believe it, we either accept it, or we reject it. And if we accept it, we're going to live in such a way that we show we accept it. It always amazes me when there are people who claim to be Christians, yet they don't even try to live the life of a Christian. That amazes me because, you see, sometimes if we claim to be a Christian, uh, or excuse me, sometimes even if we are a Christian, we struggle, don't we? 
Sometimes we have difficulties as a Christian. Sometimes we fail. We don't do what's right. We do those things that are wrong. But as a Christian, we're going to come back and correct those things, fix them, and try to get on the right path. But yet there's some who claim to be Christians who are not even trying to live correctly. We have faith. Our faith leads us to action. And we're going to study that idea more as we go through this lesson. You will notice that the word faith has five letters, five sermons. We're also going to talk about opportunity. We're going to talk about character. We're going to talk about unity. And we're going to talk about souls. But those are the upcoming weeks you'll get to, to look forward to that or, or whatever. Uh, I say look forward. You may not. But um, this morning we're going to focus on faith. Faith. In James chapter 2 we read a great deal about faith. And I invite your attention there because we're going to focus our minds on this section, and if, uh, if you've got your Bibles, I would encourage you to open it, and you might even put your ribbon marker there. There are a few other verses we'll notice, but this is the, the basis for what we're going to talk about this morning. The Bible teaches us the importance of faith. In he Hebrews 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Well, all of us want to please God, don't we? That's our goal. That's our aim. And recognizing that when we please God, we're going to have an opportunity to live with God forever. So if it's impossible to please God without faith, it's important to understand and know about this faith. What is it? What does it mean? What does it do for us? In verse 14 of James chapter 2, we begin a section there that talks about dead faith. Dead faith. It says, what doth it profit? What good does it do? What doth it profit, my brethren? Though a man say, have faith and hath not works, can faith save him? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Can faith save him? We look at other passages like Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and following, where it says, by grace we are saved through faith. Well, wait a minute, faith is a part, of that, a part of that salvation, isn't it? It's critical. But this passage says, can faith save? What type of faith? Well, here we're talking about a dead faith. A faith where a person has a belief, an understanding, but they have no works. Verse 15, if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful for the body, what does it profit? In other words, somebody comes to you. They say, hey, I, I need some food. Um, I haven't eaten in a couple of days and I need some food. Will you help me? What do we do? Well, when we look at the example of our Master and our Savior, he would take care of those types of needs. Now, I'll tell you what's interesting. Uh, you would be surprised at some of the conversations that I've had with people asking for food. Even when I'm trying to give it to them. It's unbelievable. Carried one lady some food one time. I went to the grocery store. You know, I, I bought her $30 worth of food. Gave it to her. She said, no, this isn't going to work. Excuse me? Uh-uh. I, I, wanted, I wanted hamburger meat, steak, and stuff like that, stuff I need. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, I said ma'am, I don't even eat hamburger meat and steak all the time. I said, uh, these things will be helpful for you. If you're hungry, these will, these will help you. And finally, she took them, but reluctantly. Isn't that interesting? Another person um, asked for two things, food and a ride. I said, let's take care of the food first, then we'll talk about the ride. Brought the food out, showed it to them. They said, well, what about my ride? I said, I'll give you a ride, but let's look at the food first. Make sure there's something you can eat. And make sure you don't have any allergies or anything. 
Well, well, I need a ride. That's my main thing. I need a ride. I said, well, I thought you hadn't eaten in three days. I thought food was the main thing. Well, no, man. Give me a ride. What are you doing? I, I want a ride. I said, let's look at this food first. And it on and on like that. And finally, I said, do you want the food or not? Well, if you ain't giving me no ride, then walks away. That's silliness, isn't it? Some people that are asking for things are not truly destitute of daily food, of daily need. Sometimes that happens, and we have to be careful. We have to do our best to help, but sometimes those are beyond helping. But when an opportunity arises to help someone in that way, we need to take care of it. We need to take advantage of it as best we can. It's interesting in Matthew chapter 25 when Jesus talks about the judgment that one of the things that he clearly deals with in, in talking about the day of judgment is what we've done for others. To one group that he placed on his right hand that are described as the sheep, he said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me a drink. When I was uh, naked, you clothed me. I was a stranger and you took me in. Jesus said, I mean, uh, the, those on the right hand that were the sheep said to Jesus, wait a minute, when did we ever do these things to you? He said, when you've done these things to the least of my brethren, you've done them unto me. Another group he said, when I was these things, you didn't take care of me. And because of that, you're going to be sent to everlasting destruction and punishment. Part of our judgment in this life is what we do for others. Here's a person that says to one who's in need, oh, yeah, you, you have some needs. Well, I hope you get those needs taken care of. We'll see you later. Bye. The question that James asked about that individual is, what profit are they? What good have they done? The Bible teaches us in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 that we ought to do good. Do good when we have those opportunities. Do good unto all of mankind, unto all men. And then it goes on to say, especially those of the household of faith, we're to do those good things. But if we say we have faith and we're not doing those good things, what type of faith do we have? It's clearly a dead faith. It's a faith that is good for nothing. It goes on there. Verse 17, Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. When we look at this type of dead faith, we have to understand that this faith is based upon intellect. It's simply an understanding in the mind. I believe something. I have an understanding in my mind. We read accounts or other times when people have that type of belief. John chapter 12, verse 42, we read about uh, some of those chief priests. It says they believed in Jesus, but because they were afraid of what might happen to them. They were afraid that they might be kicked out of the synagogues. They, that, in other words, they might be taken away from their job. They might be taken from the position they were in because that there were consequences. They believed that Jesus was the Son of God, yet they didn't do anything else about it. They wouldn't confess it. They wouldn't act upon it. What good does that do us? You see, that's the description of a dead faith. In other words, we believe something, but if we simply believe it and aren't willing to go beyond that, we really don't have good faith. We really don't have a foundation upon which to build. Verse 18, Yea, a man say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I'll show thee my faith by my works. The Bible teaches us that we will be known by the fruit that we bear. In other words, we're going to be known by our actions. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11 teaches me that I can't know what's on your mind. I can't know what you're thinking. I'm not like Jesus. I can't know your heart. You can't know mine. But we can get a little glimpse into those, into our understandings and our attitudes when we see actions. When I used to play football, we had a football coach that said, actions speak louder than words. You see, we had a lot of boys that liked to talk. We had a lot of them that said, oh, I'm going to whoop you and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. He said, boys, y'all need to be quiet. Because y'all talk a big game, but when it's time to play, not much there. 
It's easy to talk big. But our actions show what we truly are. What we really are. I can say I'm a Christian, but if I go to places I ought not to go and do things I ought not to do, am I? So we show our faith by our works. We show our faith by the things that we do. And when we talk about these works, let's be clear. These works are not to earn merit badges like a Boy Scout or Girl Scout. These works are doing things that God has commanded us to do. Some people will say you can't work yourself to heaven. You know what? You can't in and of yourself. What I mean by that is I can't make enough check marks and earn enough merit badges to get myself to heaven. It doesn't work that way. Somewhere, I don't know where it might be, but somewhere there's a little outfit, a little sash with a whole bunch of merit badges on it that I earn. I earn them. But heaven doesn't work that way. You see, heaven is about those people who are wanting to do what God says. Simply wanting to be obedient to God. Wanting to listen to Him. Wanting, wanting to follow the ways which He teaches. Here we clearly see that if I have a faith that will not lead me to do anything, I don't have faith. It's a dead faith. It's a faith based on my mind and that's it. It's simply an understanding that I have. That's not enough. The next section we're going to notice is verse 19 by itself. Not only does this section talk about a dead faith, it talks about a demonic faith. That doesn't mean a faith in demons. Faith in, or as it describes here in the King James Version, devils. Verse 19. But it's the same type of faith that the devils or the demons have. Notice what it says. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. Well, that's a good thing to believe, isn't it? We need to believe that there is one God. Thou doest well. Look what it says. The devils or demons also believe and tremble. One thing that's interesting about this type of faith is this type of faith goes beyond just simply understanding something. <laughs> This faith is all, both intellectual and emotional. Based on the demons or the devil's understanding, they have emotion. What does it say? They believe and they tremble. Many people will say that it's faith by itself in and of itself without anything else that will cause us and allow us to be saved. If that's the case... If that is the case, will we see Satan in heaven? Will we see demons or devils, as it's described here, in heaven? In the Bible, describing that place we understand or know as hell, Jesus described it more than any other person in the Bible. And what he said about it was that it was a place prepared for the devil and his angels. Yet, the devil and his angels believe Jesus is the Son of God. And not only do the devil and his angels believe Jesus is the Son of God, they will confess it. We read several accounts, and time doesn't allow us to go into all of them, but we read several accounts where Jesus is healing someone who has uh, a demon within them. An evil spirit, sometimes they're described as. And when Jesus comes up to that individual with this evil spirit or this demon, the demon speaking and using the person's body says something like, What have you to do with me, you son of God? In other words, they knew exactly who he was. They knew his power. And not only did they know his power, it says they trembled. We remember the uh, account of Legion. Legion. The man who was possessed with many demons. Legion. Do you remember what those demons did in speaking to uh, Jesus? They said, please, please, don't cast us into the abyss. They knew Jesus' power. 
So they went beyond just believing something. They were willing to confess it, and they even trembled at the presence of God. Yet this type of faith cannot save. This type of faith is not the type of faith that will allow a person to go to heaven. In talking to a religious friend one time, I, I brought this passage up and I said, how? they believed in salvation by faith alone. And I said, how can you justify your position when the Bible says the demons believe and tremble? Is that not, is that not a clear indication that belief or faith alone will not save us? And he said, well, comparing us to the demons is like comparing apples to oranges. I said, okay, but the problem is James makes the comparison. Not me. James says it. James says, here's faith. Here's a faith that's willing to confess. Here's a faith that's willing to even go to the point to tremble. Yet what's the end of the demons? We cannot be, and we have to make sure we don't have, a demonic type of faith. A faith that's based on the intellect, understanding something, and the emotional. Having emotions because of what we understand. And before we leave that, I want to say this. We have some religious friends out there who are looking for what they call experiences. And we have those who say that they know they're saved by the feeling that they have. That type of faith is demonic faith. Emotion based on understanding. And nothing beyond that. That's not the type of faith that will save. Now, what we are going to notice beginning in verse 20 is dynamic faith. What I mean by that is faith that saves, faith that works, faith that does something. You look at the slide and you say, wait a minute, are you telling me that faith is a leap in the dark? That's what you have there. No, 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 no. That's not what I have at all. The Bible says that faith is the substance, and we've talked about this many times, and you're probably tired of me saying the same thing that I say all the time about it. But faith is the substance of things hoped for. In other words, faith is the thing that is under and holds up our hope. Substance of things, things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. In other words, I would never ask a person, ever, to believe in God just to believe in God. I would say, look at the evidence. And I have no problem doing that because I'm confident in the evidence. And I want you to look at the evidence too because someone who believes that there is God without looking at the evidence has a very shaky foundation upon which to stand. Why do we believe in God? Because there's enough evidence in the world to prove that there is a God. I'm not saying guess, I'm not saying wonder, I'm not saying, well, it might be. I'm saying prove that there is a God. The Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We can see it by the things which are around us. So that's what faith is. It's not a leap in the dark. But we're going to notice that true faith is when God says to do something, we don't worry about the consequences. We don't worry about what could happen. You look at this. I don't know. This is just a picture that I found on the internet somewhere. I don't know how wide that gap was. I don't know how deep the gap was. It doesn't matter. When God says jump, we jump. And we let the rest of it take care of itself because God's promises are true. And when God says it and when God promises us care, when he promises us that everything's going to turn out just the way he wants it to, we follow that. We understand that. We believe it. And we do what he asks. Beginning in verse 20. It says, But wilt thou, O man, vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Here it goes back to the Old Testament. It says, what type of faith did Abraham have? Abraham had the type of faith that caused him to do what God said. Abraham believed God even to the extent that this son that he promised him in old age, 
the son that he promised him, he laid on an altar. And the Bible indicates that he had even raised the knife to sacrifice his son. Again, as I said earlier, a dynamic faith, a working faith, a living faith is the type of faith that when something, when God asks us something, we let him worry about the details. Did you know that Abraham, when he was taking his son up on that mountain, his son asked him, where's the sacrifice? What are we going to sacrifice? Abraham told him, God will provide. It's all right. Even when they got there, he believed, here's what Abraham believed. Abraham believed that, and he knew God was going to do what was best. So Abraham believed that when he sacrificed Isaac, that God would just raise him from the dead. Well, that's not how God worked it. But Abraham still had enough faith, faith to do what God asked him to do. So, of course, we recognize that he was stopped. The angel of the Lord stopped him and allowed there to be a ram that was offered in Isaac's place. But it was the faith that is by faith that Abraham offered Isaac. And it said there he was justified. Our faith is justified when we act. Justified. Our faith is shown to be true. Our faith is shown to work in difficult circumstances. Abraham was justified. It was shown that his faith was true when he did what God said. Verse 22, Seest how, uh, thou how faith wrought with his works, and by, faith, uh, by works was his faith made perfect or whole, complete. If we have an understanding in our mind, but it doesn't lead us to any action, it's incomplete faith. We talked about dead faith. But when we put those actions, those believing and understanding actions together with our faith, and we actually live the life that God wants us to live, it's at that point that we have a complete or perfect, a whole faith. Verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So many people talk about how Abraham was counted as righteous before he did this and, and before that. And they make a lot of comparisons. Listen, the fact of the matter is Abraham believed God and acted upon it. When God said do it, how do you think God would have felt if God said, Abraham, go offer your son? And Abraham said, well, God, I don't think I want to do that. Uh, he's the only son of God, rightfully. Of course, we recognize Ishmael with Hagar. He's the only rightful son that I have, and you promised him to me, so I don't think I'm going to do what you asked me to do. How do you think God would have taken that? Do you think God would have been very pleased with what he said and what he did? But you see, it was because he acted that God was pleased, and he was called the friend of God. Verse 24, you see then how that by works is a man justified, not by faith alone. Again, it's interesting that our religious friends, some of them will teach that we're saved by faith alone. But the only time that those two words show up together in our Bible, it tells us that we are not justified, uh, made right with God by faith alone. Listen, here's the truth of it. If we will get out all of the junk in our mind, and simply look to the Bible and do what it says, we'll know what the truth is. It takes someone who has a cluttered mind with all sorts of ideas and, and other things to misunderstand what these verses teach. If we're honest with ourselves, we'll know exactly what it means and what it teaches. In verse 25, it talks about Rahab, the harlot. Now, isn't this interesting? On one hand, it talks about the faith of Abraham, who's described in the book of Genesis as the father of the faithful. Here he's called the friend of God. He was the one whom the promise was made that his descendants would be as numerous as the sands of the sea, the stars of the sky. He's the one with whom the covenant was made about circumcision. 
he is used as an example, and also Rahab. Rahab, the Gentile harlot, prostitute. Isn't that interesting? But what did Rahab do? When given the opportunity to do what God wanted, she followed through with it. She did it. The Bible says that she received those messengers that were from God and sent them out another way. Now, some people go here and they'll go back to that account and say, wait a minute, Rahab lied about some things. Does that mean lying is okay? No. But let me ask this about us. Can we live a good, faithful life to Christ? Die and go to heaven and somebody be able to point back to our life and say, wait a minute, but they lied. So does that mean liars get to go to heaven? You see how that works? We can go back and point to anyone's life and say, but wait a minute, you were called faithful, but you did this. Not every action Rahab had was correct. But what Rahab did in receiving those messengers and sending them out another way was correct. And because of that, she was, it says, justified because of her faith in God. That's interesting to us. Two examples used here to show us that Faith put into action equals justification. One who's made just as if they had never sinned. But I want to go over just one book over to the book of, Je uh, book of Hebrews and go to chapter 11. And I want to notice something interesting about a section that we often describe as the hall of faith. The hall of faith. And I want you to notice about these individuals who are described in the hall of faith. And what it says they did. I'm going to go through this very rapidly, so look at it, and, and if you are a Bible marker, if you like to mark in your Bible, some don't, some don't like to do that, some do, here's what I'm going to tell you that's helpful to me if you mark in your Bible. When you see the name, underline it. When you see the action, circle it. I'll give you an example. Verse 4. By faith, Abel underline, offered, circle. You see, what did, Abel, uh, what did Abel do? By faith, he acted. By faith, he offered. Verse 5, by faith, Enoch did what? Pleased, down at the bottom of the verse. He pleased God. It goes on and talks about how he was translated, that he didn't see death, and he was not found. God translated him, um, and all of that. But what did Enoch do? Enoch, underline, Please God. Circle. Verse 7. By faith Noah, underline, moved. Circled. Prepared. Circle. Verse 8. By faith Abraham, underline, obeyed. Circle. Went. Circle. Verse 9. Sojourned. Circle. It says dwelling, dwelt. Circled. Verse 10. Looked. Circled. Verse 11, Sarah received, circled, conceived, circled, delivered, circled. Do you get the point of it? What's going on here? These people are put in the hall of faith not because they just simply had an understanding in their mind, but they allowed that understanding in their mind to cause them to obey God. Obey God. All of these things that are mentioned, they obeyed God. We can continue on and give a couple more examples. Um, notice verse 17. By faith, Abraham, this is the same example we looked at in James 2. Abraham offered Isaac. He offered. Verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau. Verse 21. By faith, Jacob worshipped. By verse 22. By faith, Joseph made mention. Verse 23, by faith Moses first was hid. That shows that his mother had faith. And then it goes on in verse 24, refused. That shows his faith. Verse 25, choosing, he chose. Verse 26, esteeming, he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater than the riches of the treasures of Egypt. In verse 27, he forsook. 
Verse 28, he kept. Verse 29, he passed through the Red Sea. Verse 30, it talks about the walls of Jericho fell down by faith. Whose faith? The walls of Jericho's faith? Can walls have faith? Wait a minute, notice what it says there. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down after they were, look what it says, compassed. Those who were encompassing the walls of Jericho were the ones that had faith, and because of their faith, the walls fell down. And then it talks about Rahab. How by faith she received the spies. Each one of those accounts, the reason I point this out is, each one of those accounts shows a dynamic faith. And I guess I should have defined or talked about this word dynamic in just a minute ago. I'll do it right now. In Romans 1.16, not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That word power is a word from which we get uh, several different words. One of those words we get from that original word that was translated power is dynamic. So what we're talking about here is a powerful faith. A faith that allows us to do something. Without powerful faith, we're not going to act. A powerful faith is going to lead to action. Each one of these in Hebrews 11 had faith enough to lead them to action. In James chapter 2, Abraham, Rahab had faith to lead them to action. We're told there that without action, our faith is nothing. So, my question is, what is your faith today? As we focus on some of these very critical elements of who we are and what we are, we have to begin with faith. That's where everything starts. In Romans 1.17, it says, The justified shall live by faith as it is written. Uh, I mean, as it is written, the justified shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. What is all of that saying? It shows the importance of faith. The importance of faith. So we have to look within ourselves and ask ourselves, do I have faith? Do I have faith enough to do what God says? It's easy to simply say, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. That's easy. What's much more difficult is to take the belief that we have and act on it. The story is told, and the story has been told for many years, and I realize it was put in the movie, um, Remember the Titans? No, not Remember the Titans. Facing the Giant. One of those football movies, anyway. It was put in the movie, and it talked about two farmers. Two farmers. Both of them were having drought conditions. So, both of them decided to pray to God for rain. One farmer prayed for rain and sat back and hoped it would. The other farmer prayed for rain, got on his tractor, and prepared the land. Guess who got rain? Both of them. But guess who was prepared? You see, what we have to do is we have to allow what God says to resonate in our minds and in our hearts. To truly believe it. Deep down believe it. And based on that belief, act. Even if we look and we say, well, God says jump and I don't see the other side. So what? God will provide the other side. And I'm not saying God's telling us to jump or anything. Uh, what, we, what, we, what we read, what God tells us is through His Word here. Through His Word. Through the Bible. But when God says things, we have to understand, I'm going to do it. What about the consequences? What about the repercussions? God will take care of those. When God says, live this way, that's the way I'm going to live. When God says, do these things, that's the way I'm going to do. And here's something I want you to understand. Your faith is not always going to lead you to be blessed physically, materially, financially. It's amazing to me how many people who live ungodly lives, and what I, mean, what I mean by that is I'm not saying they just do terrible things. I mean, they don't have God in their lives. They don't really do much with God. He's just a passing thing. How many of those types of people, when they get something, will say, oh, look what God has given me. 
wait a minute. Did God promise us that He was going to give us everything we wanted? I see a whole lot of ungodly people that have a whole lot of things. That's not the test of our faithfulness. We can't say, look what I've got. God must love me. God already loves us, whether we have anything physically or not. Do we have the faith to understand that God promised it and I need to act on it? And do we have the faith in God? So many times we put our faith in man. We put our faith in our parents, our grandparents. We put our faith in our friends. We put our faith in our children. We put our faith in everything else. And even our religion is based upon them. How many times have you heard someone say, Well, my mother or father were this, and that's what I'm going to be. Listen, I want my mother and father to go to heaven. But I know that what they do is not dependent upon me. And what I do is not dependent upon them. I've got to make the decision for myself. And you've got to make the decision for yourself. This morning, are you a faithful, faithful, faithful person who puts your faith into action by doing what God says, by living that life? I hope you are. And what I'm going to encourage you to do is, is let's get together, let's talk about it, let's figure out ways to, to help you. Because at the end of the day, if we're not faithful, if we don't have a living and active faith in God, we're not going to heaven. And I want you to go to heaven, and I believe you want me to go to heaven. So why don't we work together to ensure that we're all going to the same place so that we can be together forever? It might be that this morning you're not a child of God. The world teaches that one becomes a child of God by believing and saying a prayer. The Bible teaches that we become a child of God by having faith and acting upon it. Those actions will be things like confessing that faith. We read about those who believed in, God, in Jesus as the Son of God but wouldn't confess it. No reward for them. That action leads us to repentance, changing our mind. Every action begins in our mind, every one of them. Change your mind about it. Make sure you're, you're focusing on the things that God wants you to focus upon. And if you do that, then you're going to live a right life. And when those difficulties arise, you're going to take care of them. Repenting. Being immersed in water. This one is fault so often. I don't understand why. I have faith enough to, in God to believe that down in the bottom of that water, he can wash away my sins. I don't think the water's magical. I don't think there's anything mystical about the, the movements. I don't think there's some special words that have to be said. I simply believe God said, through his son, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. I trust him on that. Know you not that so many of us, as we're baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him in baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. I believe that. And why tarriest thou, rise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I believe that. Do you have faith enough to act upon that? To believe it and live it? And do you have the faith to live faithfully for God? That means turning away from some things that may be hard to get rid of. That means, stop, that means ending some relationships that may be difficult to end. That means stopping some actions that... <laughs> stop, not going to some places that we realize we ought not to go. That might mean a complete change in your life. You know what? It's going to mean a complete change in your life. But the fact of the matter is, if you're serious about your faith, if you're serious about going to heaven... If you're serious about being what God wants you to, you'll show it through your actions. This morning, if you're not a child of God, we've showed you how to become one. If you're not a faithful child of God, continuing to live by faith, the Bible teaches us to repent and pray. And he says that he's faithful and he's just. He'll forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. This morning, if you have a spiritual need, please help, let us help you take care of it. The opportunity will be right now. If you'll come to the front while we stand and sing. Come to me, 
He is calling, softly calling.